right, good afternoon and welcome to P-Town Fresh, the Sunday edition. Today is Sunday, uh, August the 4th, 2024. I'm so glad you're able to join us today. Uh, my name is Pastor Darren Moore coming to you live from Portsmouth, Virginia. Uh, we apologize. We did have a couple of technical difficulties, but we got everything set. Um, it just, you know, it, we good though. We moving forward. Um, so again, um, if you've never joined us before, P-Town Fresh is a unique opportunity where we connect with God, we utilize technology, I ask questions, you can ask questions, and we have a great time. Amen? Amen. Amen. So with that in mind, um, let's go ahead and get this thing going. Uh, we always like to start out with a word of prayer. So let's go ahead and pray. Most gracious Heavenly Father, we just thank you and bless your name for this wonderful day you've given us. Thank you for everybody that's with us, Lord God, in person, as well as those who are watching online on Facebook, as well as Mixcloud. Uh, and also even watching YouTube even later, Lord God. So, Father, I pray that today you will allow the word to encourage our hearts um, and just remind us of your uh, never-ending love. We thank you and give you honor and glory. In the wonderful name of Yeshua, we bless you. Amen. 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 All right. So, um, hopefully everybody can still hear me all right and everything good. So we're good too. Um, and what's up? Welcome to Pastor Ruby Brown. Can you see on Mixcloud? Yes. What's happening? Because mine is not working. Yeah, I can see on Mixcloud. I'm good. You just may need to go out and if you're and go out and go back in. I did all that. It's not working. So all right. So. Uh, let's go ahead and get started. Um, this week we're looking in Revelations 1 15. And before we start out, we always like to start out with our question of the day. And our question of the day is when were you about to make a decision, but change your mind because you heard a voice? All right, let me say that again. When were you about to make a decision? But change your mind because you heard a voice. Faith? I put something in the group chat. Um, I was picking up balls from the ground from a tree at school, and I was told not to. Then I heard someone walking outside where I was. So I ran and dropped the ball. <laughs> <laughs> the next day, I, I tried again to get the mini ball ball tree seeds. I was told I couldn't bring them inside. I got very upset. <laughs> so over time, I decided to try again. And one day, um, on the last week of school, I managed to get a bag, sneak them in the <laughs> bag, put them in my backpack, and told the hall monitor not to tell anyone. Walked well, back home. And a few days, well, a few days ago, Shauna found them, and she said, I, I need to throw them in the garbage. <laughs> All right. Um, Thank you, Faith. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Faith. That's something. That is, that is definitely <laughs> something. Amen. Honey, would you like to go? I don't know. What was the question? Wait, let me see. I can go if you want. All right. When were you about to make a decision but change your mind because you heard a voice? Um, probably when I was switching dance schools, when I went from Marines to Academy of LA, and I was like thinking, I was like, okay, so what am I going to do? And then I heard this voice, and it was like, choose Academy de Ballet, choose Academy de Ballet. And then for more confirmation, I had tried out for the competition team at Marines. And I didn't get in, but then I tried out for Storyline Christmas at Academy Day LA, and I got in. So I was like, well, this is just even more confirmation than the voice that I heard. Amen. That's good. Thank you, Shana. Mm -hmm. Anyone else? When were you about to make a decision, but change your mind because you heard a voice? Um, I have one. So many of you may or may not know that when I first started out uh, at Norfolk State University, uh, you know, I went to college at Norfolk State and 
I was uh, my first major was mass communications, but then I changed from that and was a physics major. And right before, not but the last year, probably my senior year, or junior year, um, I really began to have some uh, revelation. And that revelation was, you know, uh, I was working, I was majoring in physics, and in physics, what you have to do is you have to do some sort of research. So you have to do an internship. Um, and, you know, so one of the things I realized in my internship, I was working in the laser lab and I realized, man, I hate research. I'm not a fan of research. <laughs> and so, um, and at that point, I had a decision to make. I could either go to, uh, I could go in the field and get my grad master's degree in physics and I would have to do research or I could, um, you know, go ahead and try to work in the field just with my bachelor's degree, but I would have to do research. So I was praying and I asked God, I'm like, God, what do I do? And he said, you can teach. And that's how I started my journey of teaching. Amen. Amen. All right. Anyone else going once, going twice? When were you about to make a decision, but change your mind because you heard a voice? Well, I would say when I was deciding if I was gonna, what I was going to do for college, but I didn't change my mind. I just asked the question. Mm -hmm. And then that was, I decided to be a teacher. Not a music teacher, but just a teacher. Okay. Amen. Awesome. Well, I want us to keep that in mind today as we start on today's message and lesson. Um, so we'll be looking in the book of Revelation uh, right now. And here in P-Town Fresh, we study uh, through the Bible systematically, which means we actually go in order. Okay. Yes, Keith. Uh, just a quick question for your answer. Um, did you, at that time, did you know, did you think in yourself, like, I can do this teaching thing? Or you were a little, like, hesitant, like, God, I don't think this is for me. Um, for me, I, God was already kind of leading me towards that way. So, you know, I was enjoying, you know, I was enjoying teaching. I had a passion for teaching, but I wasn't teaching in a classroom. So, but, you know, it was more so God said it, so I'm going to do it. Um, oh, there was another time when I heard a voice. I remember uh, I told y'all about the time when I was. The girl with the skirt. No, I was working at um, I was working at Home Depot one summer, and many t as many teachers do during the summertime, you know, they do a part time job, and mine was Home Depot, and so I said, you know what, I like this. I'm, you know, I was getting a lot of favor when I was there, even when I interviewed for the job. The you know, the interviewer, the manager, they were like, well, you want a manager's position? <laughs> you know, I was that, you know, I guess I was that qualified. And one of the things that ended up happening, um, I did well there that summer. And then the school year came and started. And I was like, OK, well, you know what? I can continue this on. I can make a little more money, help the family out and, you know, do this thing. So it was the pre-week before the students come back. The teachers start, you know, we go to our meetings. And I went to that first day, sat in the meeting all day. Then I pulled up in the Home Depot parking lot, tired. Couldn't even stay awake during the meeting. And, you know, I was all set to go in. And God said, look, this is all right. He said, you can do this your way or you can do this my way. Doing this hustle thing is all right for, you know, other people, but not for you. Which way you want to do? And I said, your way. And so that's when I ended up walking in. I went and resigned from Home Depot. And that next, that same week, I was looking online because we did need a little extra money. I was looking online. I just looked at our school district's website and they actually had a job opening for a technology teacher. And ended up, uh, long story short, ended up getting that position. Um, it was great favor because not only was I just teaching technology, I taught uh, robotics. They bought robots. 
I taught music production. They brought keyboards. And it was a wonderful thing. They lived right around the corner. It was uh, The church was right around the corner from me. I could have walked there uh, from my house. And they fed me. And they even gave me a planning period. And instead of $10 an hour at Home Depot or, Depot or whatever I was making, I was making $25 an hour. Wow. So 25, hour, 25 an hour for nine hours a week, that's not bad. That's that damn money. And they feed you. And... It's right. You don't even have to waste any gas money if you don't want to. And they give you a planning period in that time. I was like, yes. So that was my way. And I see that DJ uh, Raw B said, I'm in that spot right now. Well, hopefully today's message will give you a little bit of encouragement and guidance, uh, DJ Raw B. Uh, because it's, it's important. So with that in mind, y'all ready to jump in? All right. So here we go. So we've been reading in Revelation one. OK. And uh, last time we started, I'm going to go ahead and read for verse 14 for context. His head and hair were white like wool. And I'm reading from the New King James Version, y'all. His head and hair were white like wool, as white as snow and his eyes like a flame of fire. His feet were like fine brass, as if refined in a furnace, and his voice is the sound of many waters. He had in his right hand seven stars, out of his mouth went a sharp two-edged sword, and his countenance was like the sun shining in its strength. And that's where we'll stop for now. So um, last time we were reminded of Revelation 1.15, and John's description of his vision of the Messiah having, as we just read, with feet like what? Like bronze or brass, all right, bronze, fresh out of the furnace, or as we called them, the hot penny shoes. All right, so now, if you missed that, you, you need to go back and check it out so you can learn all about the hot penny shoes. So we also learned that the bronze feet represented judgment, mobility, and stability. And so now let's... Uh, continue on in uh, verse, pardon me, verse 15. And it reads, his feet were like fine brass, as if refined in a furnace. And that's where we left off last week. And his voice as the sound of many waters. So here's a question. What do you think is meant or represented by the voice as the sound of many waters? What you say, Keith? Ages past. Ages past? Yes. Okay, what do you mean? Like, like, a, like from many years, you know, the ancestors when they speak to us. Okay. All right, so the ancestors speaking to us from, uh, from uh, a while ago. Yeah. All right, anyone else? When I think of many waters, I think of like calm. So maybe like a calm voice. Okay, a calm voice. All right. Anyone else? Well, for me, when I think of, when I'm thinking of this, let, let's turn to Ezekiel 43 for a moment. All right, verse 2. Mm -hmm. You said Ezekiel what? Ezekiel 43. And I'll begin in verse 1 for context. Afterward, he brought me to the gate, the gate that faces toward the east. And behold, the glory of the God of Israel came from the way of the east. His voice was like the what? The sound of many waters. The sound of many waters. And the earth shone with his glory. It was like the appearance of the vision which I saw, like the vision which I saw when I came to destroy the city. The visions were like the vision which I saw by the river Chibar, and I fell on my face. 
And the glory of the Lord came into the temple by the way of the gate, which faces towards the east. The spirit lifted me up and brought me into the inner court and behold, the glory of the Lord filled the temple. So if we see here in this passage, what was going on? We see that this is the prophet Ezekiel and he's having a vision, right? Much like John, all right? The apostle John is he's having this vision in Revelation. And in this vision that Ezekiel has, what similarity do you see? The voice of the sound of many waters. Amen? Amen. And so this what represented who? This was the glory of who? The, the, God, of the God of Israel. So this is God. Amen? Amen? Now, when I think of the voice, when I think of, first of all, not just the voice of many waters, but when I think of the sound of many waters, what sound does that make? I hear a, you know, a huge rainstorm. You ever, you know. It gets so loud, it almost gets quiet. Well, that too, but for me, one of the things is usually, you know, and we've had some storms even this week where, you know, you're just sitting there, you know, maybe talking. Then all of a sudden you just hear this. And you're like, whoa, is that wind? And, you, and even, you know, for me, what I do sometimes, I'll even stop my conversation and be like, did you hear that? Is that rain? Yeah. Is, does anybody else do that? Yeah, yeah sometimes. Yeah. Hope you don't have to drive. Anymore. All right. So for me, one of the things this helps to speak of is the attention that his voice requires. It commands our attention. Amen? Amen. So when you hear that voice, you know, it's just like when you hear that rain, and somebody's at the door coming up. Um, when you hear that rain, you just stop what you're doing. Like, hold up, what, what, what's that? Amen? Amen. So, my question is when was the last time that you stopped what you were doing? When you to listen to the voice of God. So again, when was the last time that you stopped what you were doing to listen to the voice of God? When did you stop what you're doing to listen to the voice of God? Mm -hmm. it's something to think about. And welcome to Keontae and welcome to Joseph Wagner. All right. Something to think about, isn't it? Because that means that, you know, chances are if, if you did that, that meant that you possibly weren't doing what you needed to do and God may have needed to give you a little guidance. Or you had to make a major decision. Or you had to make a major decision. So if you notice in that case of what we mentioned. And one of the things I realized is that, you know, his word says... His sheep know his what? Voice. Voice. And a stranger they won't follow. One of the things we have to do as believers, we have to learn the fine art of hearing his voice. And one of the things that helps us to hear his voice is, one, being obedient. Because the more that we're obedient, the more of the chances that we'll what? Hear his voice. Would you agree? Amen. And so I think that one of the things we need to do, you know, we need to learn to be sensitive. I think we live in a time where everybody is moving, 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 moving so fast. But many of us don't stop to take time to think about what's really going on. We don't stop to take time to listen to hear God. We just move. You know, almost like, you know, the, the thought comes to me, you know, we talked recently about Samson. You know, that great strong man with the locks. You know, had them fine lock sisters. You know, y'all would have been like, oh, look at them locks. But this brother, you know, he went to a point where, 
you know, remember the, the, the young lady, he saw the young lady and he was like, talk to his parents. Yo, get her for me. I want her. I don't care if she's from the Philistines. I want her. And so in that example, he was listening to his flesh. Because his parents was like, are you sure, baby? Wouldn't you like one of these nice Israelite girls? You don't need to go over there to the other side and get them Philistines. You know they a little rough. They built different. They got that Goliath gene in them. <laughs> okay. Right? And But uh, uh, instead, what did he do? He, he didn't listen. And we see how that turned out. If you missed that, you got to go back and check out a couple weeks ago. I forgot the name of that lesson, but it was good. But I think that one of the things we need to do is we need to learn to be sensitive to hear the voice of God. We got to listen. We got to respond. We got to obey. Amen? Amen. And so another thing that another level of significance of hearing the voice this you know, with this, like the sound of many waters is that it confirms that this is the same characteristic that Ezekiel had saw in his vision, right? So now we can identify and say, you know what? It's the same voice. It is the same God that's speaking. Because it would have been one thing if Ezekiel would have heard the voice of many waters and John heard the voice saying, wimpy, wimpy, wimpy. Right? Like that old hefty commercial. Hefty, hefty, hefty. Wimpy, wimpy, wimpy. Imagine if he says, imagine if this is what it sounded like to John. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end, says the Lord, who is and who was and who is to come. The Almighty. So, so uh, Mickey Mouse. <laughs> this is Do weird. not be afraid. That's not Mickey Mouse. That's Piggy Bird. <laughs> I am the first and the last. I am he who lives and was dead. And behold, I am alive forevermore. Amen. And I have the keys of Hades and of death. Would you actually take them seriously? No. Like, no. <laughs> you know, like, yo, hold up. Am I in a dream? Is this a, where's the camera at? Hold up. Is this one of them Disney movies? Is that Jiminy the Cricket? <laughs> right? It's a, it's a whole mess. But when you hear that sound, if you hear somebody like, you know, James like James Earl Jones, exactly. Do not be afraid. I am. I mean, think about it. Think about Darth Vader. One of the most characteristic voices around. I am your father. Morgan Freeman. It made, it, it made you stop, right? It made you stop and listen like, yo, James Earl Jones was the perfect voice for that. <laughs> yeah, they said, sound like Toad talking to Princess Peach. <laughs> <laughs> what in the world <laughs> Pastor Ruby Brown said what grass smelling is the voice <laughs> amen but are y'all understanding this thing so it's, it's important when we see that there, there's a significance there that you know what we need to pay attention and I believe in the same time if we listen now the Lord God commands our attention all we have to do is just stop and listen. Amen? Amen. And it seems like we, hopefully Mixcloud didn't lose us. I don't know if y'all can still hear me on Mixcloud. I see the, there we go. Um, I don't know, Mixcloud may be glitching. It started doing the little circle thing. Miss Cloud has had a glitch before, so that may be a mixed cloud glitch. We'll see. 
but no worries. We can also always up update it and upload it on uh, YouTube. All right. So here's a question. How does it make you feel when you hear that the vision that John saw on the island of Patmos has similar characteristics as the vision of Ezekiel? How does that make you feel? It carried more weight. How so? It, it just carried to show it to be true. Say again. It just showed that it to be true. Amen. Anyone else? How does that make you feel? How does that make us feel? Let's see, DJ I said, feels good. Amen. It's it's good. I thought it said feels good. My phone, my uh <laughs> cup was in the way of it. I didn't see the it's. But it say feels good like Tony, Tony, Tony. <laughs> but for me, it's a spirit of confirmation. I love it. It's exciting. Because it's like, hey. It's the same voice. This is the same God. And a lot of times, if we listen to a lot of different people, a lot of people will be like, oh, well, God ain't real. Um, the Bible ain't real. You know, it's just a book made up by men. But here we see the confirmation of what happened in the old as the same similar characteristic as what's happening in the New Testament. This is hundreds of years later. And I'm sure that the audience of the readers of uh, Revelation, you know, the audience to whom this book was intended, you know, this letter of Revelation was intended, then is that they were familiar with Ezekiel. Amen? Yeah. And so with that in mind, as they were familiar with Ezekiel, then they were familiar when they heard this voice of many waters, they probably associated it with that. All right, so now let's continue on. Back to Revelations 1.16. Now we're moving on to verse 16, y'all. Say, keep it moving. <laughs> so here we go. He had in his right hand seven stars. Out of his mouth went a sharp two-edged sword. And his countenance was like the sun shining in its strength. So let's break this down. So first of all, to identify the significance of the seven stars, no, it doesn't mean that he was going in the uh, in the uh, five percent nation. All right, he's not going in the nation of Islam because you know they they got the the stars and stuff like that. No, nah, that's not what this is. It says out of his mouth went a sharp two-edged sword. And his countenance was like the sun shining in his strength. So let's take a look at, we're going to jump down. And usually I don't go ahead in, in, in the passage unless there's a reason, unless the later on it explains something. So let's go down to verse 20, shall we? Mm -hmm. Of Revelation, Revelation 120 now. The mystery of the seven stars, which you saw in my right hand, and the seven golden lampstands. The seven stars are the angels of the seven churches. And the seven lampstands which you saw are the seven churches. So, as a reminder, remember, what did the lampstands represent? The seven churches. All right. And let's go back. Verse 11 tells us what those churches were. Listen to this. Saying, I'm the Alpha and the Omega. I'm sorry. I am the Alpha and the Omega. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> no. Nah. Okay. I am the Alpha and the Omega. The first and the last. And what you see, write in a book. And send it to the seven churches, which are in Asia. To Ephesus. To Smyrna. To Pergamos. To Thyatira. To Sardis to Philadelphia, and to Laodicea. Amen? Amen? And so the seven stars are the angels of the seven churches. So you get it? So you got the seven lampstands. They were the what? Seven, seven churches. churches. Now, keep in mind, this is not just the, uh, you know, this wasn't 
uh, the first church of Thyatira, the second church of Ephesus, the third church of Smyrna. You know, they didn't necessarily weren't in, you know, didn't have to be in church buildings and all of that. You know, th that's not what this is talking about, but this is the community of believers. Amen. Mm -hmm. So what do we mean by this term angels? Angels is the Greek word agelos, which means a messenger. Okay, one who is sent. All right. So the seven stars then are the messengers of the seven churches. So each church has a what? Messenger. A messenger. So now it's important because again, if we just read in the sense of it's the angel of the church, then we think, you know, many of us, when we think of an angel, we conjure up the, the, the image of the, you know, two wing creature, you know, just right. That's not saying that each church has a winged angel. All right. That's not what this is saying. So I don't want you to think that there is an angel attached to the church of the first corner brownstone church. <laughs> right. All right. Or, or, you know, bedside Baptist, you know, the third revelation. No, this is not necessarily saying that there's an angel for each of these churches. Not in this, the literal sense of what we say with a winged angel, but a messenger. So this messenger represents somebody who is sent. Okay. And so another way to think of it may be the leaders of each of the seven churches, which we may call the what? Pastors. The pastor, right? In common now, we may call them the, the pastor. So here's a question. Why would God use, let's talk about the star imagery. So we know that the star represents the angels or the messengers of each of the churches, but why use the image of a star? Anyone? Maybe because there's a bunch of stars in the sky. Maybe because there's a bunch of stars in the sky. Okay. Is he thinking of the, you know, the Disney? It just make, it was like, when you wish upon a star. Mm. Because maybe there's just there's only seven churches represented, but in the world there's a lot of churches, so maybe it's just, just a bunch of churches. Okay, well let's take a look. My thought is I have a couple of thoughts behind that. One, maybe because what do stars do? They what's their job? Illuminate. They illuminate. They shine and provide a guiding light. To those who are walking in the darkness. Amen? Amen. So let's take a look at Matthew chapter 5. Matthew Beginning in verse 13. And this may be a familiar passage to some. You are the salt of the earth. <laughs> that's another one. <laughs> yeah, that's another one. But it's right there. I'm typing it in. All right. You are the salt of the earth, but if the salt loses its flavor, how shall it be seasoned? It is then good for nothing but to be thrown out and trampled underfoot by men. And we've talked about this several times. Because salt back then was used as a what? Preservative. A preservative, exactly. And so if that preservative isn't, isn't good, it's like a broken refrigerator. What's, what's the use of a broken refrigerator? Nothing. 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 Some people might talk to your friend and be like, you know what? You like a broken refrigerator. You can't keep nothing. <laughs> Excuse me for my dad, Fat Albert joke. 
For those of you who are a little older, you may remember the jokes that Fat Albert used to make. They used to make, uh, what was it, Dumb Donald or whatever. You're like school on a Saturday. What? No class. <laughs> the original originator of the dad jokes. But anyway. So, again, if this salt is good for nothing, if it's old salt, it can't preserve anything. Because that was one of the main things. They didn't have refrigerators. They didn't have Frigidaire. So what did they do? They salted it. They ate it when it was ready. But if they wanted to preserve it a little bit longer, they needed to salt it. It was good for nothing, though. If the salt was good for nothing, you just, it's useless. And then we go to verse 14. You are, now, honey. The light of the world. Excellent. <laughs> it's all about timing. No. <laughs> You are the light of the world. A city that is set on a hill cannot be hidden. Nor do they light a lamp and put it under a basket. But on a what? A lampstand. And it gives light to all who are in the house. Let your light so shine before men so they may see your good works and glorify your Father in heaven. That's a powerful passage, isn't it? Mm -hmm. He says, you know, it reminds me of that old song. This little light of mine, I'm going, oh, I was all off. This little light of mine, I'm going to let it shine. This little light of mine, I'm going to let it shine. Let it shine, let it shine, let it shine. Come on, everybody. Oh. This little light of mine. I can't hear y'all. I'm going to let it shine. This little light of mine. Come on. I'm going to let, let it shine. <laughs> this little light of, of mine. I'm going to let, 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 let it shine. Let it shine. Let it shine. Let it shine. I know Facebook is like, what in the world? How am I going <laughs> to interpret this? Only a P-Town Fresh. But anyway, so everybody's familiar with that, right? And that's our responsibility. That's something we learn. You know, that's a song that we learned, many of us learn as kids. I know I did. And what does it teach us? It teaches us that we need to let our light shine and not hide it. Although that's what some people may do. So what does that mean, though? How do we let our light shine? Yes, I do. Um, I guess it's not Say what? Just show boldness and not be afraid. Show boldness and not be afraid. Okay, good. What else? How do we let our light shine? Share the love of Christ with other people as you go around your life. About your life. Okay. The way we treat people and consider others. Mm, that's good. The way we treat people and consider others. We need to learn to walk in love. Or as the old song says, walk in the light, the beautiful light. That's what we need to do as believers. And I think that as I think about this imagery, because he could have chose any image, right? For the, but he said, as stars in the right hand. And so that's something for us to think about. How do you currently let your light shine before men? This week, how have you let your light shine? Or were you one of those, I'm going to use the light under the covers so nobody can see what I'm doing. It's only going to help me. If somebody could. <laughs> but everybody understand mm -hmm. what's the purpose of it if you got a light under the covers what good is it doing anyone as a matter of you said what it's the, broken it's the broken refrigerator all it's doing you, you, you looking only reason you got a light under the covers is you trying to read a magazine or read something that you shouldn't be reading when it's time to go to bed right 
But what is it, what do you do? When it's time to get up, you pull open the blinds, let the light come in, turn on the light. And that's what we need to do. So many of us are believers with that little flashlight under the covers. And nobody can, no one can even tell that it's on. If somebody walks in your room, how is that flashlight under the covers going to help them? It's not. It's going to confuse them more than anything. What? Why is there a light? What, what's going on here? Everyone understand? And so one of the things we need to do is we need to be sensitive to God and ask God, God, speak to me this week and let me know how I need to let my light shine. Thoughts, questions, comments, responses before I continue. Amen. So let's move on. Another verse that makes me think of. So one, I think that they chose. I think that God chose the star maybe because they should. The messenger should be shining like stars and providing a guiding light. But also, maybe because they were supposed to follow in the example of the light of the world, Yeshua. Let's turn to John, the book of John, chapter 8. Beginning in verse 12. Again, Yeshua spoke to them saying, I am the what? The light of the world. Whoever follows me will not walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. He's saying that he is the what? The light of the world. He turns on his light so the whole world can see. So the whole world will not stumble in darkness. Because what's one of the things you do without light? Stumble. You know, I, 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 I know, you know, several times I get up in the middle of the night. Well, let's just say, for instance, when I first got to my house. Now I know a little bit more around in the dark. But when I first got here, man, and it was dark, trying to walk around, bumping into stuff, or lo and behold, go somewhere else, like a hotel room or spend the night at a family's member's house, especially family member's house, because they got everything in there. You got to get up in the middle of the night to go to the bathroom. Can't see anything. Bump, bump your shin on the dresser. Mm. Right? Yep. But when you have that light. And then imagine, and I don't know about you. I'll give you a perfect example. Something that happens to me sometimes. So me, I really can't see that well um, without my glasses. So, But I don't sleep with my glasses on. So... You know, it's been on occasion where I may fall asleep and I put my glasses, you know, on my nightstand. But somehow, maybe they don't make it to the nightstand or somehow they they, they fall off or something. And so now I get up in the middle of the night and I'm in trouble because not only is it dark, I can't see. And so I'm fumbling around looking for my glasses because I can't see. So I'm just feeling around like blind man playing Ray Charles. <laughs> Only for me to finally find my glasses. Now, what would really help, though, and sometimes I'm so tempted to turn. No, I'm tempted to turn on the light because I know where the light is. And then I can see. But if I do that, then I wake up my wife. Decisions, decisions. <laughs> it's a good thing that I love you, honey. Because what I do now, I've learned to turn on the flashlight on my phone, and that helps me. But, oh, when I can turn, but even sometimes the phone flashlight ain't good enough, and I just can't see until the morning. And when in the morning, that's when I cut on the lights, and then they're right there. Nightlight. Amen? <laughs> Everybody understanding this? Mm -hmm. But so here's the thing. I want you to think about me waking up in the middle of the night trying to find my glasses, trying to go to the restroom like people around you 
They're trying to find their way. By following you, are you going to cause them to stumble in the darkness? Or is your life, are you so well lit? Do you keep it lit so much that everybody can see where they're going by following you? Amen. Amen. And then, and so, you know, again, we have the conversation, the question of, you know, what we need to ask ourselves, are we walking in darkness or in the light? Because Yeshua says, I'm the light of the world. Whoever follows me will not walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. If you're following them, then you should be walking in the light. But if you are walking in darkness, embracing the deeds of darkness, are you truly walking in the light? No. So think about what you can do to improve your light bearing ability. How can you fix your light? And now let's continue on. So where does God, where does John see these stars in this vision? Anyone? Where does John see the stars in the vision? Where are they located? Well, you're back in Revelation. You're still in yeah, John. I'm back in Revelation. Oh. I don't know. So where is John seeing them? He's seeing the vision, right? But if we look carefully, in verse 16, it says what? In his right hand. In his right hand. He had seven stars. He had seven stars. So where are they in this vision? He's seeing them in his, in his right hand. In his right hand, in Yeshua's right hand. What do you think is the significance of the right hand? God, because Jesus sits at the right hand of God. Okay. Good. What else? A lot of people are right-handed. A lot of people are right-handed. It must be a dominant feature. Okay. Well, there's a couple of things that come to mind. So first, I'm going to come at you with the practical. So in today's Middle Eastern Arab culture, even in Arab culture now. Um, it is, did you know that it's rude to shake somebody's hand with the left hand? It's rude? It's very rude. I mean, in our culture, we just use our right hand. We just use our right hand. But in the Arab culture, it's rude. It's an insult if I give you my left hand. You know why that is? No. It's because the left hand is used for self-cleaning. Toiletry. Wiping. So, literally. D does that make sense? So, again, when I think of the right hand, even in Arab culture, the right it's honorable to extend someone the right hand. Does that make sense? So, let's look at it, what it says in the scriptures. Let's go to Psalms 110. Verse 1, the Lord said to my Lord, sit at my right hand till I make your enemies your footstool. Who's that referring to? David. Well, no, David is writing it, but who is this referring to? The Lord said to my Lord. This is talking about Yeshua, about Jesus. The Lord said to my Lord, sit at my right hand till I make your enemies my footstool. This is referring to Jesus. What is holding in the right hand signify? If we're holding something. Anyone? 
He's not throwing the stars, is he? <laughs> I didn't say that. He's holding it. What you hold, you control. I'm reminded of the passage of Scripture, Proverbs 21, verse 1. The king's heart is in what? The hand of the Lord. Like the rivers of water, he turns it wherever he wishes. Amen? So the king's heart is in God's hand. What, what does that mean? He turns it just like the rivers of water. That means what? He controls it. He directs it. So what does it mean if they are in his right hand? If the stars are in his right hand, what does that mean? He what? Control stars. He controls them. He directs them. And remember, who do the stars represent? The seven churches. Not the seven churches, but the, the, angels the, the messengers of the seven churches. So here's a question for you. Would you say that you are in the right hand of God. Does God have you in the palm in the center of his right hand? Hmm. Would you say the same of your pastor, your messenger, your spiritual leader? Something to think about, isn't it? Because one, one of the things we want to do is we want to be able to be pliable. We want to be pottery in the hand of the Lord. You are the potter and I am the clay. Mold me and make me. We want to be pliable before God. Yield it before God. Amen? And... I think that is where we will stop. I was going to go on to the two-edged sword, but I'm going to wait until next week for that. So what are your, th and uh, oh, by the way, today's title is uh, Holding Light. I'm sorry, it's the only thing I could come up with. Holding light. Holding light. He's holding stars. That's holding light. Y'all probably can come up with a lot better title but thank you Faith. all right so thoughts questions comments responses anyone say what just earn our right to be a star in the right hand earn our right to be a star in the right hand amen Can we earn our right to be? How do we earn our right? Because you got to follow God, but if you ain't following God, then he ain't got no use for you. Exactly. <clears throat> you got the sheep, you got the goats. Which one are you? Y'all claiming to want to be the goat. Everybody want to be the goat, but do you really want to be the goat? Ooh, I ain't going to go there. Anyone else? Such as? Uh, like the questions you ask, are you in the right hand of the Father? Are you actually trying to do what he wants you to do? Are you his messenger? Or you have got your own message? Mm. That's deep. Because he did say a messenger. And that's the thing. There's some people who just decide they want to just say write their own script. Nope. Imagine if you go in there, you're watching a Denzel movie. And, you know, it's written and produced. Somebody wrote and produced it, right? They, they got a script. He just get in there and just start saying, you know what? I'm not feeling the script. He just say, King Kong ain't got nothing on me. Out of nowhere. Like, I just felt it, I just felt it belong there. How would that go? Uh, Especially uh, if it's a nice little love movie. Oh. You know, he's sitting there. You know, everybody like Denzel. All the ladies like Denzel. So he's sitting there, you know, one of them preacher wife. What was it? The the 
yeah, the preacher's wife m- m- moments, you know, where he was he was an angel in that one. <laughs> yes, he was. But imagine, you know, he he pulls out a line from another movie. You're like what in the world? Just, edit just you know, just edit that out. But you know what? That's what some of us do. There are some people who God has given them a particular script, a particular message, and they say, you know what? I'm not feeling that. I'm going to remix it. Yeah. Case in point, Jonah. What did Jonah do? He started traveling somewhere. He started traveling somewhere. God gave him a message to get to Nineveh. Jonah like, Nah, I ain't feeling that script. Rewrite. <laughs> Exit. We're going to change that scene. Instead of me going to Nineveh, I like that boat. See that boat? We're going to we gonna pay money right here, and we're going to get that boat in this next scene. And I'm going to take that going that way. Forget the Nineveh thing. Mm-hmm. How'd that work out for him? Not well. He ended up in a whale. Not only in the whale, in the whale's guts. Stinky. Whales, you know, are in the fit in the sea. Anything in the sea smells like the sea. Can you imagine? You know, you know, I me one of the the most, I guess, not uh, desired jobs is fish cleaning, especially fish guts. One of the things I couldn't stand is, you know, you clean the guts, you put them in the trash can, and then they don't pick up the trash, and it's the summer. Ooh wee! Imagine that's what Jonah was sleeping in. Mm. When when Jonah came out the well, I've been like, "Look, bro, you need to go jump in that sea for a little bit. Then come back and holler at me." <laughs> but again, he followed, tried to follow his own script. That's good, honey. I like that. Anyone else? Thoughts, questions, comments, responses. Amen. Well, I think that's a good stopping point. Oh, yeah, don't ignore the phone call. Don't ignore the phone call. Good. What do you mean by that, Keith? Because you talked about earlier, like, um, hearing the voice of God. And I, I feel like sometimes we, well, with Jonah, we ignore the way he's talking to us. So. Amen. That's good, because sometimes we just decide we want to do what we want to do. And press news. And as we do that, or we ignore that call, we see we see God come up on the caller ID. You hear you hear the phone ring. You pull it up. You pick it up. You see God's name on the caller ID. Do I really want to answer this right now? And send a text. I can't respond right now. I hope you don't do that to me. <laughs> But that's what he does. This is how we do, though. But that's a great point you said, Keith. Imagine if he did us like that. But tell the truth. Don't we do that? Don't we do that sometimes? God is telling you a clear message. Look, you know you don't need to be. You know what? God, I'm sorry. I can't hear you right now. Um, <laughs> what you say? Can you hear me now? Huh? Huh? Knowing you got five bars. <laughs> Cause don't front y'all. You know y'all did that. I'm going to tell you what we used to do back in the day. And what's up? Welcome, Angela Brown. One of the things that remind me. <laughs> don't ask me why I thought of this. But back in the day, if you wanted to get off the phone with somebody, especially when three-way calling came on. The internet thing. Nah. So what we would do. So, you know, at first... Back, I'm going to give you a little history lesson. At first, when you call, and if somebody you were talking to somebody on the phone, it was busy. Then they came up with this creative thing called call waiting. So then you could click over. Then they added to it, and they said, okay, well, we make a three-way. So if you want two or three people on the same call, they can all be on the same call. Well, one thing you we used to do, or at least I used to do, if it was somebody I wanted to get off the phone with, I start playing with the receiver. <laughs> so they hear click, click. You, you, I think somebody trying to click in. 
Oh, hold on. Oh, you know what? I got to go. And then you magically hang up on them. And then you magically hang up on them. And you never call them back. And some of y'all do the same thing. You be like, look, call me in three minutes. But again, please don't play God like that. When he calls, we need to what? Answer. All right. Pick the phone up, huh? Stevie Wonder song, pick the phone up. I don't know. I don't know. Um, so with that in mind, let's get ready to pray out. Anybody enjoy today? Amen. Anybody learn something? That's good. All right, let's go ahead and pray. Most gracious Heavenly Father, we just thank you and bless your name. We thank you for this wonderful day that you've given us. Thank you for the lesson that you've given us, God, helping us to understand and see uh, just number one, understanding the, the value in hearing your voice. Just being able to hear your voice is a privilege and an honor. But Lord, when we hear it, Lord God, let us do like Samuel and say, here I am. What do you want, Lord? Father, I speak for your servant listens. Help us to take that posture with you, God. So we can hear what you're saying. And not just move on to our next task or press ignore or just to be so wrapped up in what we're doing that we miss you speaking into our lives. Father, I also pray that you'll help us, even as we read in the passage about the messengers, the stars of the seven churches being in your hand. Help us to represent in the same way, Lord God, let us be found in your right hand. Lord God, let us be found with honor and let us be found truly reflecting and resembling you in the same way as you are the light of the world. Let us be reflections of that light to everyone that we encounter. That they might no longer walk in darkness, but they may walk in the light. Thank you, Father. In those areas where we're falling short, help us to improve. Help us to do better, God. So that others might see our good works and glorify you, our Father, which is in heaven. Thank you, Father. Let me give you honor and glory. In the wonderful name of Yeshua, we bless you. Amen. Amen. All right. Well, I don't know about you, but I've definitely enjoyed today. Thank you all so much for hanging out with us today. And I uh, hope you learned something. Oh, excuse me. I think I might need a little nap. But anyway, um, you said what? No time for naps today. No time for naps today. But we really enjoyed y'all. Um, actually, this Wednesday, we will be back in action uh, for prayer. So join us, uh, feel free to join us at 6 o'clock in the morning for uh, P-Town Fresh Pajama Prayer. Uh, if you're checking us out on Mixcloud, just uh, send me uh, an email and we'll send you that uh, link. I just called to say hello, Stevie Wonder. Oh, I just called to say, hello, to say I love you. Yeah, that's Not I called to say hello, I just called to say I love you. you okay, yes. yeah, yeah. So, but yeah. And um, so thank you for the Mixed Cloud audience as well as Facebook. And um, also anybody checking this out on YouTube. Uh, so Lord willing, um, make, do me a favor. If you're checking this out on YouTube, please subscribe to our channel. So that way you'll be notified of uh, all of our live upload videos. Um, we'll, we'll be uploading more um, this is to come. And we also have uh, videos dating back 10 years. We got a full archive there. 10 years plus now. So again, make sure you check that out. Um, Great resource, great tools for you. All right, so love y'all. Lord willing, we'll be back to see y'all next Sunday. Be blessed. And then please, one of the things we want you to do is your homework is what? Talk to God, number one. Listen to him. And then as you're listening to him, see how you can let your light shine and how he wants you to help improve and let your light shine before others. All right, love y'all. Be blessed.
Peace. And let's take it to the outro. Peace.